Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name's Jodie. I'm one of the committee members for AFAP, and I'm really pleased to be joined um, by one of our consultants from BOFAS, Rick Brown, who's kindly doing a talk for this evening on flat feet in children and teenagers. Um, really pleased to all see that you've come and joined us. Um, so I'd just like to start by introducing Rick. So Rick is a consultant foot and ankle surgeon um, based in Oxford. And then he also does his private work at the Nuffield Hospital in Cheltenham. Um, he has a, a particular interest in paediatric feet, so was the perfect person to ask to deliver this talk for us today. So what we're going to do is we're going to have roughly 25 minutes, 30 minute talk presentation from Rick, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. So if I can ask if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. We'll keep an eye on those and then I will um, kind of look through those questions and pose them to Rick at the end for you. Um, and other than that, I'd like to say thank you very much and enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Jody. Thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, so... Um... Right. Um, can you see that? Is that okay, Jody? Yeah, that looks perfect. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for asking me to, to speak this evening. I'm, I am I'm very pleased to be invited. I've worked with you for many years and I looked after children and had children's clinics in Bristol Children's Hospital and in Cheltenham for about 12 years. And now I over in Oxford, I see the adolescents uh, and inherit them from the children's surgeons. Uh, so I, what I wanted to do for the next half hour really is to, to give you a a flavor of my approach to the flat foot and the, the younger population. Um, and then the structure that I try and teach our Oxford registrars to think about this when they see a child or an adolescent with a flat foot. And then um, as your physiotherapist, I don't want to bore you with too many operative details, but give you um, a guide to the types of operations that can do and maybe the indications and when you might want to talk to your, your surgical colleague about when to think about a surgical option. Um, so really, Fit flat feet in children and adults, but flat feet, particularly in kids, we divide into two clear divisions between flexible and rigid. It all depends on whether the flattened arch here um, reforms when the, the child stands up on tiptoes. And uh, the way I approach this and try and teach the registrars is to think about things in threes. So really our three main groups is the idiopathic, which is the, the vast majority. There's the flexible flat feet, which have the, in the bottom uh, corner here. And then there's the rigid flat feet. And within those um, sections here, there are three different, by far the commonest uh, associated conditions in the flexible group and in the rigid group. And that uh, gives the registrars a very straightforward way of trying to think through a, the common differential diagnosis. So we'll start with the idiopathic really. Uh, and and um, you'll be aware that the medial arch, medial longitudinal arch um, usually corrects, but most children are born in fact, all children are born with no arch, and by the age of three, um, still 80% uh, of children have no medial arch. And this develops as they grow, as the ligaments get stronger and the bones change and alter shapes. Uh, the correctability can be assessed, and the important thing is to uh, a Jacques test, but just asking the child to stand up on tiptoes is the most important thing. And you can passively reproduce this by the windlass mechanism. So this is when you take the foot uh, you hold the ankle and then you dorsiflex the big toe and you'll see the plantar fascia, um, it'll tighten and the arch will reconstruct. Um, and the absolute key thing when you're dealing with a child, you're never dealing with just the child, you're dealing with the whole family. And if you want to um, get the parents on side for your discussion later on about the flexible flat foot, I always make a little bit of a dance about watching this and getting the parents to see also the arch reforms and standing on tiptoes and making sure it's quite clear how this is such a great thing. And, and uh, I do ham that up a little bit, but then that becomes very useful later on when you're discussing the treatment options um, or in the flexible painless flat feet, the lack and no need for treatment, um, they will have seen why. Of course, as the arch reforms, the hind foot and valgus will move across to varus and you want to see that as well to see that there is good correction in the subtalar joint. So if, the, if they have a, a, an arch that recorrects and it's a pain-free flexible flat foot, that is normal. 
The classic study that uh, everyone talks about was by um, Harris at the end of the Second World War when he was surveying all the 18, 19 year olds in Canada coming to join the army. 20% of these 18 year olds still had a flat foot. And all of these guys had uh, walked across and taken trains across to get to across the Canadian plains to join the army and all were totally uh, fit and able, but had uh, asymptomatic flat feet. A clear message is that for a painless or pain-free flat foot that's flexible, there is no need for orthotics. It does not change to their natural history. There's a whole industry that uh, will try and sell these to your patients and to, to families, but if they're pain-free and flexible, you just they, you will not change the natural history. Um, and this blue picture is just a nice illustration of what happens when you do ink tests and you can see the normal arch here and you can see with the flat foot, the arch, arch is uh, collapsing down and makes a much broader midfoot. So if the, the patient has a flexible flat foot that is painful, then, then yes, then there is a role for insoles or orthotics, which will be to control the talus, to help uh, support underneath the navicular and to, as with the heel cup device, this deep uh, little basin, to help push the heel back in from excess valgus perhaps into the correct position. Um, and if they are particularly deformed or particularly flat, then you'll need a particularly strong orthotic and, and these become more rigid, harder to wear in shoes, but that the very deep cupped ones are called UCBL inserts. Um, now, the, uh, one of the driving mechanisms of this is this is to those three different causes of a flexible flat foot. That's the tight Achilles tendon. Then the, the first thing and the most important thing to get a patient and child to do is to do stretches. So that, that's the top one of the tight tendon Achilles. Always look for a tight tendon Achilles in a flexible flat foot because that's something that the, the child can improve. This can be a situation where the arch was forming the early uh, teens and perhaps later after the growth spurt, it's collapsed again because Achilles has become tight due to a mismatch in the growth of the tendons compared to the bones. So helping the family to stretch out um, probably makes a difference. Everyone tells people to do it. You can see an improved ankle dorsiflexion range. Some papers have come out to say actually it's not so effective, but I, like as you know from uh, most of the uh, interventions, there are so many other multifactorial issues about whether the families have done the stretches. It's quite hard to prove, but look for the tight Achilles tendon. And then um, with the positive silver scope, start a stretching program. Uh, you're all um, very skilled. There are 93 skilled physiotherapists out there. So I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs about what to do, um, but that's one of the things to always look for. An accessory navicular. Um, this is a, a flexible flat foot. And uh, the, the, the extra bone is actually a normal variant. So just having one of these is not a disease, it's not a problem. It's only if it becomes painful and it tends to become painful if there's been some overuse. So perhaps a growth spurt, perhaps they've changed schools, they've increased their activity, um, they have um, taken up a, a, a sport. Uh, to, for, actually at the moment, there, I've seen a couple of kids because the rugby season has been extended into after Easter and the ground's harder and therefore they're having more foot problems. So there'll be some change in training or behavior which may have set off the problem which is in the synchondrosis between this extra navicular bone and the main navicular. And the tenderness you can uh, diagnose pretty much in the second sentence when you ask the, the child to point out where the pain is. It's usually over a bump on the inside of the uh, midfoot. We look for this, uh, and I'll show you some pictures in a moment, with an, the best view is an AP oblique x-ray. Um, an MRI can be arranged, but it's really usually not very necessary. Um, it's more often the MRI com patient comes with the MRI because it was a, discovered because this was arranged for another reason. It, the signal will be increased in a particularly painful accessory navicular. And if there's been some diagnostic conundrum and you're not sure if this normal variant is a significant finding and the source of the pain, um, you can organize a spec scan. However, we would really be reluctant to do that because you don't want to be having excess radiation in, in the young population of teenagers. So here, here's a, a diagram you can see here. You can see this is a particularly small one, slightly larger one. There are different types of accessory navicular. 
This is a proper sesamoid bone, the small one. That means it's within the tendon like the patella um, or like the uh, sesamoids of the big toe within FHB. This is a, this type two, the more common one where there's a much bigger synchondrosis. Um, and there are, I, I always like to show these little diagrams to keep this registrars on the toes, but important, effectively what's important about this is this one's too small to give any trouble. This third one, it's actually um, fused across and therefore it's not moving. So it really rarely gives trouble. It's these two with a big synchondrosis uh, and um, they, they have the ability to become inflamed. And these are the this ones in the middle, the ones that are big, the big synchondrosis are type twos that give the trouble. So what to do about it? Restrict activities. We're mobile, that depends, you know, a good strong talking to, change of sports. Um, if the, the um, family, I uh, feel it's really severe and the child says, I feel you might put them in a walker boot. If you completely don't trust the teenagers, and that's a big issue about looking after teenagers, if they are going to ignore you, then you can wrap them up in a cast that they can't take off, um, but restrict the activity somehow. And you'll see the uh, pain will dramatically drop. It doesn't go away always in six weeks. It might take two courses of six weeks. And then you've got to very gradually reintroduce sport with strengthening physiotherapy to make sure that they aren't um, predisposed to a quick overuse injury when they quickly return to sport. Once you've been successful, then you need to protect them further with some arch supports um, and this restricted activities need to gradually be reintroduced. That is how you treat the majority of painful, flexible flat feet with an accessory navicular. However, um, we do get to play a little bit uh, and uh, we can, uh, if that, that fails, a kidna procedure involves excising the actual extra bone. The, the original paper didn't get very good results, but we've learned since then that if you um, tighten up tib posts, so that uh, means a little drill hole in the bone, and really tighten up tib posts, it's going to be pulling properly on the true navicular, um, you'll get better results. And if the child has a very severe hind foot valgus and a complex flat foot deformity, you'll also get better results if you address that and bring the hind foot valgus back to less than 15 degrees. After surgery, it's back to exactly the same. You guys, it's very important to do the strengthening and have an arch support in the medium term recovery. And here you can see a picture. That's the very large bump. You can see it's taken off. That's the real, the, the, the real navicular and I'll find the tip post and bring it down through a drill hole into, into that area. So the third group of the flexible flat feet that um, um, you can spot and uh, they behave differently are the children with uh, hyper laxity or congenital ligamentous laxity. And uh, the scoring, I think you'll probably use the same bait and scores out of nine. And anyone really over four would be moderate um, hyper laxity. It's your job, which I, which I, again, sorry for to ask you to suck eggs, but strengthening all the other muscles to improve the secondary stabilizers, the corrective orthotic around the flat foot. Um, they may want to wear above ankle walking boots to school. They may want to use bracing, although the, mostly when you get to teenagers, they laugh at you if you suggest or show pictures of that on the internet. Um, but we try these things to try and stabilize the flat foot, uh, first of all, because we really, really want to avoid operating on a flat foot. If you do, then uh, we will use internal braces or other augments are available, but um, this is to give support to the spring ligament and the medial side of the foot. Otherwise, they just will stretch out whatever repair you do. Um, they need longer rehab. And before you embark on operating in a teenager or even an adult with hyperlaxity, you need to make sure you can trust the patient. If they're going to do whatever they want, it's not going to work. Don't waste your time. Um, if, if they can have a conversation and just expectations, they agree to do the rehab and have shown you that they've done the rehab beforehand, then um, you can uh, expect reasonable results with augments. So for the main batch of idiopathic or flat feet that are flexible, um, when they're really severe, then we might operate. But this is just in a normal practice, such as I had in Cheltenham for 12 years, there was maybe one every other year. The more common flexible flat foot to operate on has underlying neurological reasons. So they're flexible, but they will have some um, weakness or perhaps minor mild spasticity. So that's what's driving this deformity. Um, and you need to look at a, a very high suspicion for a possible underlying neurological condition for the ones that just don't get better. 
And the types of operations we can do, I'll show you some pictures, but uh, this is uh, doing a lateral column lengthening um, where we stick a little block of bone into the calcaneum to make this longer and push the foot round. And this is when we take the heel and we cut it here in the middle of the calcaneum, slide it across. Um, we debate about which ones you should do, but um, if the, this is the effect of a lateral column length, and you can see this is the, the end of the, the uh, uh, calcaneum here on the cuboid, and that's been brought up to be pointing parallel to the axis of the foot. So it's pushed the outside of the foot round. And what it's done is push this bone round, whereas this pushing the heel across in the sagittal plane helps to realign this thing, line called Mary's line. And to decide which one to do, it, it is important to be aware of this concept of the um, acetabulum of the foot. Or if you want to confuse your patients or come from Tunbridge Wells, acetabularis pedis. And this is the, effectively at the ball and socket joint in the middle of the foot, around which the uh, midfoot rotates. And if it deforms and collapses, there'll be rotation at the midfoot um, because of this ball and socket type behavior. There's also sliding in the subtalar joints. So it's, uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, but this is the area to look at. And therefore, if you look at this child that did well from the lateral column lengthening, you can see this navicular sitting off the talus. So if I saw a patient like this, I'd say, okay, this is the one that teenager who'd do better with the lateral column length thing whereas if they presented already like this then I'd be thinking about doing a calcaneal shift and this is where we in the same picture before there's the, the, the calcaneum is um, the sorry the, the, uh, the cuboid is divided here you can either do it in the cuboid you can do it in the calcaneum either side and in fact in older people you may do it in the calcaneal cuboid joint because you are, this is already becoming degenerate but you lengthen the lateral column somewhere, um, hold it in place. The kids are great because they'll heal, so you can hold them with just wires which come out as opposed to plates and screws. Um, whereas the alternative is the shifting the heel across. And in Oxford, we tend to do that with um, minimally invasive surgery and, a, and a small burr, but you can do it with a big extended lateral approach, whatever the surgeon wants to do to be able to see what he's doing. This may also expose deformity al along the first ray. And then uh, it's a, a complex deformity, so you need to think about addressing any other three-dimensional problems with the midfoot with an osteotomy in the midfoot. We talked before about the tightness of the gastrocnemius, and if that is a driving factor in the ones that fail to get better, then you may need to lengthen the, uh, the uh, gastrocnemius either here at the strayer level or we're now doing it higher up um, behind the knee in the proximal medial head of gastroc. So when you're thinking about uh, flexible flat feet um, that don't get better, think about why. It's not just a tib post in teenagers. There are, is stretching of the spring ligament. There may be midfoot deformity. Um, and um, it's particularly important to also just uh, think if there is a good correction of the midfoot compared to the hind foot. Now, although this is an adult photograph and it's illustrating checking to make sure that when the hind foot is in the correct position, the forefoot is able to uh, supinate and pronate back comfortably in and out of the position of deformity to balance. Um, if it's fixed, then it won't. You want to be able to assess that. In adults, it's because of arthritis and damage. In kids, it may be that they have an abnormal connection between bones, or it may be because they've had um, uh, a, a other um, abnormal morphology. If a topical or uh, inflammatory subject as always what to do about this thing called the sinus tarsi implant or the arthroeresis screw. Um, th this is effectively a piece of metal shoved into the uh, subtalar joint to stop excess movement and, and act as a stop on the subtalar joint. Um, it's extremely popular in flexible flat feet for example in Italy they are um, often used just for a flexible flat foot that is a bit of minimal pain my main experience has been, of these has been taking them out and the patients are extremely pleased when you take them out because effectively you've got a big mechanical block to how to stopping how the foot wants to move. However, and, and currently NICE, still current from 2009, currently NICE um, do not really approve of these and they still don't approve them in children without taking part in a, an audit or prospective um, followed up study. There may be a good role, and I think I'm being more persuaded in the very severe deformity 
to put these in as a temporizing measure where, where everyone knows that this is just for a number of years to allow ligaments to strengthen, muscles to improve, muscles to get stronger because of aging and growth um, and to stop deformity of bone. So they may have a role for the re as an ad adjunct in a more very severe feat. But uh, as a treatment for a flexible flat foot that's a little bit sore, I think that's not right. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a study for very severe patients who might be considering lateral column lengthening. Um, that's a big operation, which is 18% of the lateral column lengthenings go back for another operation. And arthrosis screws were removed in 18% of theirs. So the, the, the really severe ones, there may be a, a role. So back to this uh, mnemonic or way of trying to remember things in threes. Um, I would have thought of fours, but my brain can't remember four, so I stuck to three. Um, the rigid ones, if you think about coalitions, um, CVT, which is congenital vertical talus, and uh, trauma after injuries. So tarsal coalitions are, are actually not that uncommon. It's 3% of the population. They are often uh, bilateral or found in uh, uh, two places within the same foot. And the commonest traditionally has been the calcaneal navicular, followed by the talocalcaneal. Patients present with a rigid flat foot, uh, and it's usually provoked when they start to become a bit more active, um, and they can have pain over the uh, tarsal coalition, so laterally side for the calcaneal navicular, or medial side for the tarsal coalition. But often it's more subtle. Often it's due to recurrent sprains of the, the ankle, uh, or muscle spasms of the calf, or general ache. And, and it's often much, much more vague as a general finding. So in a teenager, check to see that a flat foot is flexible. If it's not, uh, even if they have the most vague presenting complaint, think of a tarsal coalition. These are failures of separation in the embryonic development, and they start out as cartilaginous, and as the child grows, they become ossified and bony. Sometimes they don't bridge across, and they stay as fibrous. Um, and here you can see a really clear bony one. Uh, and on the MRI, there's a little bit of a line here. We'll see some better fibrous ones shortly. Um, but uh, be aware of these. And the, they present at different age groups depending uh, when the bone starts to ossify. So with a flexible cartilaginous, flexible child's foot, they don't have any problem. But as they reach uh, maturity, the foot gets bigger, it becomes stiffer, uh, then they start running into trouble. So. The calcaneal navicular age group is a bit younger, it's 8 to 12, and the 12 to 16 year olds are the older ones, this talocalcaneal or subtalar. Um, interestingly, because we have much more readily available access to MRIs than I had when I started, um, therefore they're now being picked up as silent findings. Um, there are other ones, Taylor navicular coalitions, you can, in fact, you can have, I've seen most bones connected by now, but the two main groups are calcaneal navicular and talocalcaneal. This is the classic anteater sign. So this is meant to be the body that the anteater and the snout. That's the calcaneal navicular. And this is the C sign, a, a white ring around here, where you have uh, the um, um, hint of uh, a talocalcaneal coalition. The ex other x-rays to order are a Harris axial view. This is meant on the left is meant to show the spacing the normal middle facet and the posterior facet. And here you can see a middle facet doesn't look right. It's pointing the wrong direction. It's narrowed, it's degenerate. And that's because there is a fibrous coalition. But we don't, well, we can take these. If you've got good radiographers, they can take these, but they're tricky. Whereas the CT scan is just, it gives you all the answers. And you can see here two fibrous subtalar coalitions of tarsal um, calcaneal coalitions, um, and they're fibrous. And this is the sagittal view of the same thing. Most important thing, especially as a physio, if you see these, it's recognition. If they've been recognized, then treat them non-operatively with a cast, immobilize them, and usually you can avoid the need for surgery um, at the first presentation and maybe several more presentations. And then it'll be a matter of discussing timing of surgery, perhaps. Um, if the child wants to grow up to be a uh, IT technician who enjoys eating donuts, this isn't gonna be a problem. If they want to take part in the Scottish uh, gymnastics team in the Commonwealth Games next year, this would be a big problem. So it's all about uh, what uh, life and, and uh, activity requirements the young person grows up to need. Um, for surgery, to give you a flavour of that, there are two different beasts. 
um, the Tarsal Coalition is uh, the, uh, the, the Kakenian and Navicular Coalition, sorry, um, do very well. And what we do is remove the block of bone connecting the two or the, the two sides of the fibrous coalition with the irregular painful area in between. And then we put some fat um, or we put some of extensive digitorum brevis muscle because it's right there, right beside where you're operating, put that in the hole and that allows over the next few weeks the space to fill up with fibrous tissue, which is uh, flexible, just basically scar tissue and therefore um, not causing pain. Patients, uh, depending how young they are, you might protect a young child in a plaster. The older ones, you say, look, here's some crutches um, and just don't do very much if you can trust them and they can keep some flexibility of the ankle and the other joints. It's counterintuitive to wrap them up in plaster because you're doing this because you are you have a rigid stiff foot and you want to make it flexible. So the more time they are on plaster, the more backwards you go. So really I try and avoid plasters if I can, but it can hurt and they start hating you. Um, and you get that look from the parents of real hate. So it's a balance about when you immobilize them or not. But the important point um, is removing the bone for these. And here's a, a picture, that's, that's the lateral approach. You can see the bridge between um, calcaneum and navicular, that wasn't going to move. This is my uh, osteosomes and sores in there, just making it free, taking it out. See, it's now a little in the sample dish, but you can see the big space that's there, which allows the correct movements of the whole subtalar complex, the midfoot and the acetabulum of the foot. Now, these are a different animal entirely. These are the talocalcaneal coalitions. Um, they, are, they don't do so well, they present later. It's a key thing as everybody out there from physios to surgeons to think about these. Um, we need to know what they are, we do CTs, they all look slightly different. Um, some will do much better than others. This one will do well, this one's steep and dives down, it's gonna be difficult. This one's already starting to get degenerate. Um, and um, this one's going back onto the posterior facet, which is why that's a bit worrying. If they present in childhood, we would nearly always try and resect them these days. Um, if they present with degeneration at any age, then it's too late. You may have to think about fusion. Usually the degenerate ones are the early 20s and older, and the teenagers haven't yet got any de degeneration. So um, it really is, in my opinion, uh, for teenagers um, below 20, it's an operation to try and excise these. If you do fuse them, it depends where the degeneration is. We can do subtalar fusions, double fusions, triple fusions. It's lots of fun. But the important part is to realign the foot as well. There's no point in making it stiff in the wrong shape, or there's no, also no point in resecting it and making it flexible in the wrong shape. So the important part is also to consider realignment. And a traditional open surgery described by Scanton, um, you just find, you just simply find it, put, it up, put some retractors in, chisel it away, and then Bob's your uncle. The problem is, there are two problems. Firstly, it's right underneath all the clockwork, which is a bit scary. And secondly, um, you never quite know where the level of the joint is on the inside as you start removing bone from the outside. So there, these can be tricky even with open surgery. Um, and they have neurovascular damage, they have stiffness, it's a big wound, the tens get stuck down, which is why over the last seven or eight years, it's become attractive to do these arthroscopically. Uh, this is an operation I still find challenging and interesting. It's tricky. And I think we're beginning to work out which ones you can do smoothly arthroscopically. Um, and those are the smaller ones that uh, in a slim patient um, and the other ones to avoid are the ones I showed you a picture before with the coalition is a fibrous coalition diving down at a steep angle because those can be very difficult to find your way around um, once you are inside the joint, working from inside out. Clearly, with a metal ball that's spinning at 5,000 revolutions per minute, when you get to the outside, you stop because you're now underneath the neurovascular bundle. Um, so quite uh, interesting surgery. So we had um, mentioned this before, that if you've got really severe deformity, um, not only do you have to remove the coalition or an older adult fuse, but you need to correct the deformity. You can see here the alignment of down the talus to the calcaneum, that's about 25, 30 degrees of hindfoot valgus. So you'll need to do something like a calcaneum osteotomy 
once you've uh, removed the coalition. Um, <clears throat> and the bottom line is um, the calcaneal navicular ones do much better than talo calcaneal. We talked about having three different causes of rigid flat feet to be able to remember. Congenital vertical talus, um, they usually present with a rocker bottom foot in, uh, at birth uh, or certainly in infancy in the first year, but they can be a, a subtle form where you have a congenital oblique talus. So the middle of the foot doesn't move and it's very rigid and there's this bit of an arch, but not much. And they're too young any to have any way to have a significant arch, but they have that stiffness. And that's because the talus is effectively subluxed or dislocated, presenting uh, problems with uh, the midfoot movements. Um, it's all about recognizing this. Um, the important thing about uh, this, they often have um, a underlying abnormality, whether it be a chromosomal problem, spina bifida is very associated with this, and arthrogryposis where all the elbows, knees, hind feet, everything is stiff. Um, so if you pick this up, or think about it, if you pick it up, then uh, it's time to refer it to a multidisciplinary team to try and find the underlying cause from the pediatrician, the geneticist, um, and how to deal with it. It's very specialist to send it somewhere where they do these on a regular basis. I only see these now to fuse them, um, but when we saw them at Bristol Kids Hospital, um, we would do a thing called the reverse Ponsetti. So you remove Ponsetti for a club foot. This is effectively the same steps, but in the opposite directions um, to try and correct this deformity when there's still flexibility and you can try and reduce the navicular back onto the talus. So finally, just to, for completeness, the, this third um, form of rigid flat foot is after an injury, so as a child who had a severe burn and a contracture and they had a rigid flat foot. So um, think of those three things. Um, okay, well, I, I hope that's a, that's a guide um, to how I think about children and teenagers with flat feet. And I hope that uh, has been interesting. Um, any questions? Thanks, Rick. That was really interesting and nice. To, well, I like your rule of threes. Hope that'll help us all remember what we need to look for. Um, if I could start us off maybe with some questions. So just obviously you started, we kind of your coalitions are within more your rigid flat foot. Are coalitions always rigid? Yeah, well, I have that structured and it, the structure is useful to remember things. But unfortunately, in the real world, everything doesn't quite follow that. And uh, you, especially the younger ones, some coalitions can have some flexibility. So they will ask them to stand up on tiptoes and they will still have some correction of their medial longitudinal arch. But then when you examine their foot, it's, it's often the subtalar movements correcting the valgus that you see, you, you detect a stiffness and that is the warning bell. So um, not everything is, not all coalitions are rigid. There are sometimes some subtle ones. Mm. And um... If someone's, got, is there an ideal age for the surgery for those coalitions? So, I mean, you say some of them, they're picked up as silent ones, say if they've had imaging for another reason, say when they're eight or nine. If you picked up coalition at that point, is there, is there scope to do the surgery earlier? Is that better to maintain that movement or is it better to wait until they're more skeletally mature? Is, what's the ideal? So there is a, um, a, a Pediatric growth curve, as you well know, Jody, with your young family. <laughs> there, there is a um, pediatric uh, foot growth curve as well. And, and there's, there's a different one for boys and one for girls. So you can, it goes up and then it goes you know, plateau phase. But uh, there's an argument for trying to get the foot to be bigger before you go and do an operation which might cause a growth arrest or cause mm -hmm. abnormal shapes. So you would probably want to wait a little bit. If they presented, it, if they presented with the a uh, sub-tailor one, tarso, tailor calcaneal, at seven or eight, you might try and chivy them along for a few more years, but it depends on a balance on what symptoms they're having and, and, and how much limitation they have, and that becomes a minefield because you may have, I have had patients who, who children who are brought in, their parents who say that Johnny's gonna be the best ever cricketer and he's just can't possibly play. But actually, Johnny hates cricket and doesn't want to be like his dad and, and, and uh, would be more than happy to take up swimming or, 
or needlework or something and not have to have the same needs. So he would be perhaps having an unnecessary operation. Yeah, that's really hard. Just as you say, it's not just the child you're treating a lot of the time, is it? It's the family as well. A um, couple of questions coming in now. So just uh, one question we've got, the, the arthresis screw, how does that actually work? Is it literally just blocking that subtalar joint completely? Yeah, so um, you, in the, you really need a picture to see this, but um, if you go into the sinus tarsi, the idea is to, to stop the sideways movement of the talus as it rotates excessively. So if it rotates excessively, then it drives the foot into the, the calcaneum into valgus. So if you can, because it's really the calcaneum that's rotating in the talus. So if yeah. you can stop, stop in there and you, you it can either wedge it in or you can screw it into the actual extra articular bone. So it is fairly brutal. Mm. And they, there are some absorbable ones, there are some metal ones. There's still a high removal rate in all of them. Okay. And um, we've got a question here as well that what they want to know what your opinion is in regards to Achilles release versus gastroc release. So I presume the medial head of gastroc release for severe ankle equinus, which ones do better postoperatively in your opinion? So the, what, the, the choice of the operation depends on our good old friend, the silver skull test. Okay. And um, if the, the sort of proximal one where you're more superficial, they have a quicker recovery if, if you can get away with just doing that. But if the silver skull test is effectively negative, so both gastroc and soleus are tight, then you need to go distally. And then you have a choice of um, whether you can do a hoke technique, which is three little stabs. And even in adults, you can get some very good correction with that, get the foot plantigrade, and they will recover. You know, we can protect it in a cast for four to six weeks, and they will do very relatively well. Uh, but you probably can only correct 20 degrees of Aquinas. If someone presents, this is now adults, because teenagers aren't usually as bad unless they've got severe cerebral palsy or something. If, you, if you've got 30 or 40 degrees, which are some of the ones we get over in Oxford, then um, you might need to do a whole posterior release and then you're opening up the capsules of the joints. It's really stiff. And then they're in for recovery. It's going to take a lot longer, three to six months. That's interesting with a silver scale. That's a good tip. Um, in terms of your, your coalition foot, will they have their interosseous ligaments at all? And if not, are you solely relying on scar tissue to form the, the fibrosis and the ligaments for that new joint that you've created? So... For the calcaneum and navicular joints, so um, the capsule will be the only thing giving stability there okay. uh, for that one. For the um, sub tailor joint, then um, if you do it open, you'll still have the interosseous ligaments because you're coming from medial inwards. Whereas if I go in arthroscopically, then with my big burr spinning at 5,000 RPM, um, I wouldn't like to say what state the ligaments are in on the way out. It's, they often, to get, it's a tricky operation. So to get access, you're doing this sort of funny thing and the ligaments are right in your firing line. Mm. So interestingly, they are probably need, they probably are nearly always taken. However, um, this is a stiff foot and that you want some, you know, by losing that, they get to regain some movement. I suppose we're not, you're not recreating a normal joint as such, are you? You're trying to, if it's all going to fibrose afterwards and have more of a flexible joint, it's there's some inherent stability in that still as well, isn't there? Yeah, and they, and well, you've seen some of my patients, they, they, they get better movement than they had before, ever had before, but they don't get normal movement. No, yeah. It's a long rehab, isn't it, when you take, get, try and get them going again. Mm. And the question is, you know, a very obvious question is, what, are you leaving behind because there's an irregular surface surface whatever way you do it that probably forms scar tissue over the top you don't want too much scar tissue that won't move again um, people have tried putting cartilage in there people have taken um, fetal cartilage and padded it down on top to, in a small case series to see if that would try and create a, a proper medial facet once more and they say that gives good results but um I'm not sure if the parents of Cheltenham would like me to be bringing dead children's cartilage into their <laughs> Maybe a while off. Maybe a while off, yeah. Um, Juliet Ball's got a question. So if a child or adolescent has a flexible, non-painful foot, do they have any increased risk of developing tip post dysfunction later on to someone that's 
considered to have inverted commas, she's put a normal medial longitudinal arch. Do we have any prospective studies on that? No. We don't. But we might, I think there might, there, it is a bit like um, an iceberg, isn't it? Some of those normal feet that we're campaigning and saying don't need any treatment, some of those go on and develop a progressive collapsed flat foot. Mm -hmm. so, um, but we can't, we're not good at, we don't have a means to spot which ones. It, that's, that, that is an absolute key fascinating area to try and work out which ones and, and you would need to take a longitudinal study but you'd be having your, your starting population would be tens of thousands to try and find the, the, the 20 or 30 that end up in yeah. trouble. It would be hard to do. Um, yeah, no, massive one. Um, Jesse's asked as well, for your medial head of gastroc release, um, is there any reason why you just do the medial head and not the medial and the lateral head? The yeah, yeah. medial head is responsible for most of the tightness. It's around 60 or 70% of the tightness. So okay. to do one good stripe, you can get um, about 15 millimeters of length, which gives about 15 degrees of dorsiflexion. So you get a lot of improvement. You don't need to do the lateral head. Also, if you do the lateral head, then you've got to navigate your way past the bit in the middle. Yeah. The vascular bundle. Quite a lot of important stuff there. Yeah. Um, regards, so if, there's a couple of questions around the accessory navicular. So first of all, Sally's asked, do you, if, if you pick up someone's got an accessory navicular, is there benefit of trying conservative measures first? So con conservative physio and orthoses, those kind of things, and see yeah. if we can settle it down? Always, always. Yeah. I mean, I, I, they could usually come to us having been through your hands, but if, if they've found their way without any non-operative treatment, then you take them right back to doing all of that. Okay, great. And if, if the, you found that if they're not getting better and you're considering surgery, is there ever a point for fusing the navicular, um, the accessory navicular, rather than removing it? Or then I suppose, are you creating kind of a bump of bone that then the, the tendon's got to pass over? Um, well, there's no great advantage to doing that because if you take, take tip post off the accessory and then tighten it really securely onto the main, main navicular, then they will have all the function they need. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you won't have to run the risk of non-unions. The, um, um, the, the patient's are usually quite grateful that that bump has gone. I suppose, do they complain of it rubbing on shoes sometimes as well in that way? What you, what you can do as part of the workup if you're uncertain, I didn't mention this slides, there's a role for a, a I recommend ultrasound guided, but a very precise injection into the sin uh, chondrosis to see if that's the source of pain. But it's very grisly, it doesn't take much fluid, it's hard to do, the children won't like it, um, but it is an option I said, that can be taught, people do talk about. Okay, uh, we've probably got time for one more. So, um, Regarding the forefoot surgeries, long-term outcomes that you talked about. So one slide quoted that 18% of lateral column lengthening and sinus tarsi implants need further surgery at some stage. Is there, have we got similar data about the calcaneal shift patients? No, we probably, not that I've seen, no. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a global discrepancy. The Americans and the Australians are more interested in calcaneal um, so lateral column lengthenings mm -hmm. and um, they may also be more driven to using the arthrosis screws so most of the research has been comparing those two and, and if you have a really severe deformity there are people who've tried um, both, both so once. lengthen the lateral column and shift the heel across but I probably have one patient on my waiting list that might need that there's a big fear of that is you're taking one bone and dividing in two places um, potentially, and the blood supply might have issues. Mm. And what kind of surgeries are they tending to need later on? Those four foot surgeries. Those, those are the. Um, that was just for a couple. I think that follow up was maybe two years or four years. So it's okay. Removal of the screw, but also plates need to come out or re redo. removal of metal work stuff and, and other stuff. So it's, it's housekeeping type surgery, I think. Okay, so it's not kind of that we we know further down the line they're needing fusion surgeries or anything like that that we know of at the minute not, not within a short follow-up of two or four years no. yeah okay 
That's great. Well, I think that takes us to quarter past eight. So we've got through most of the questions. Um, thank you for some, I think we've kind of, we've gone here, there and everywhere with the questions, which has been great. So um, I'd like to say thank you to Rick for joining us and for a great talk. Thank you to everyone for attending. Um, just to let you know that you will get a, a link out to you tomorrow at some point, ask him for some feedback for the session. And once we've got your feedback back, you'll get a certificate to say that you attended this evening. So grateful for feedback for us to keep these relevant and uh, asking the questions that you want to know. So thank you very much. Thanks again, Rick. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. I hope you all have a nice evening.